Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining our webinar. We're going to give people a couple minutes to log in. And um, at this time, we are going to launch a poll. So please, if you're online, uh, share us, share with us your role in your organization. And then in the chat, let us know where you're dialing in from. Fort Lauderdale. I have a I have a friend whose dad calls Fort Lauderdale Fort Lauderdale. -da. Strangely, he's from New Orleans. If you can imagine that. Twenty people. Also, if we have not identified your role in the poll here, the role in the poll, uh, please drop it into the chat. We'd love to hear about other people that are joining our webinar, just random people that are at coffee shops, baristas, wanting to know about <laughs> modern continuous security. Could be a thing, I don't know. Stephen, we'll we'll cover uh, all the stuff at the end of the webinar here. The things you're gonna get from Alexa slash Nicole, um, but yes, it will go to the email that you registered with. Hi, Jimmy. For those of you who missed it, there is a poll going on right now. We'd love to know what role you have in your organization, even if it's barista. Uh, and then also in the chat, let us know where you're dialing in from. So we can say good morning, good evening, good afternoon, good night. <laughs> Someone once told me on the internet, everything is good morning. So everywhere you are, whenever you're talking to these people on the internet, good morning. Marietta. Did I say it right? Marietta? <laughs> Representing the 303. Where's my 720 people? Hello? Sorry. It's a bad new, new to Denver joke. Oklahoma. Ah, <laughs> fine. I'm really 720 as well. <laughs> Oh, wine country. Now I'm jealous. There's no wine in this room currently. Dallas, Texas, couple Oklahomas. Love that. We're going to give it two more minutes and then we'll fire ourselves off here. Right after, right at five after. How's that, Alexa? I was just about to say that and you beat me to it. Cool. Wait, does everyone have nice weather today? Like, is it a whole countrywide nice weather day or is there stormy stuff happening East Coast, West Coast? Nice weather in Colorado today. Nice in New Jersey. All right, love that. I mean, okay, so... I feel like Everett, Washington, cloudy is just regular. And I might be wrong on that, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, see, exactly. <laughs> just so it's nice weather. Okay, good. <laughs> Anybody got stormy weather happening right now? Anybody out there with stormy weather? <laughs> kind of gross in Maryland. <laughs> 
Yeah. And also rage tragedy in Maryland. So that sucks. Bad weather in Indiana. Oh yeah, that's no good. Overcast in South Florida. Hmm. It's the weather report with Scott Gerlach. <laughs> right here in the middle of the country, you can see we've got really nice weather. And over here on the coast, we've got some spa, spa, spotty, spotty patches of cloudiness. And then Pacific Northwest, uh, it's normal. It's regular cloudiness. All right, let's go, Alexa. Oh, I will I will share. I'm currently in Denver today, but um, I reside in Folsom, California, and it is 48 degrees and raining. So I picked a wonderful week to be here. Um, and with that in mind, um, let's get started. So welcome everyone to our webinar, What Does Modern Continuous Security Look Like? My name is Alexa Sevilla, and I'm the Director of Product Marketing here at Stackhawk. I'm very excited to have our Stackhawk co-founders, Joni Clipper and Scott Gerlach, talk through a continuous approach to security, what that looks like, why it matters, and why you should care. To get started, we do have that active poll open. So if you're just tuning in, uh, let us know your role. And then again, if you've just joined and missed the weather report, let us know where you're dialing in from and what your weather is. And with that, I will pass it over to Joni and Scott to get started. Thanks, Alexa. Uh, weather report on the sixes, so stay tuned. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining. Again, there is a poll going. Lots of polls today. Uh, very interactive session. Q&A is open. If you got a question, please ask a question. Hit us up in the chat. We will stop and answer your question the best we can. Uh, there's going to be a ton of polls. We love getting kind of poll feedback from you. Uh, and we're here talking about, as Alexa said, what does modern continuous security look like? And maybe the more important part, how can I get there? Me as a, a practitioner, a leader, a developer, a security person, a barista. Um, if you missed that joke earlier, go back when you watch the recording. Let's do some intros here real quick. Joni. Hi, everyone. Um, as Scott said, it's always the morning. So good morning. Um, my name is Joni, CEO and co-founder of Stackhawk. Before um, starting the company, I was the VP of product at a company called VictorOps. It was acquired by Splunk. But I've really spent the last 15 years building products as a product leader in uh, the DevOps ecosystem. And Stackhawk is really all about helping developers find and fix security bugs before they deploy to production. Um, a little bit more about me. So I, I love to travel. I don't get to travel probably as much as I would like, but when my husband and I travel, um, we are star chasers, but of the Michelin variety. <laughs> so we love planning our trips around great food, um, which is always such a delight. I'm a dog mom to Q, who's a whippet in Tokyo. That is an insane pandemic baby chihuahua. Um, and you can find me on LinkedIn there. Awesome. Uh, I'm Scott Gerlach, uh, CSO, Chief Security Officer and Co-Founder here at Stackhawk. Um, my previous life, I was the CISO at SendGrid for about three years, did a variety of different roles at, at GoDaddy, ending at Senior Security Architect. I'm a husband, dad, golfer, and a home Kubernetes admin. Uh, so things are very complicated at my house, which I like to call husband job security, uh, much to the chagrin of my wife. Uh, you can find my Twitter and my LinkedIn there as well. If you want to chat after this, uh, reach me on LinkedIn, reach me on Twitter. We'll, we'll keep talking. So today, Joni, I think we're just, are we just talking about shift left basically here? Yeah. I mean, but like, what do you hear when you hear shift left? So a lot of people on this call are probably like, Hmm, I hear jargon and a whole lot of nothing. I'm not entirely sure what that means. Um, if there, I saw some software engineers are on the call, they might be thinking, I hear you're adding even more responsibilities to my job other than just building value for my, our customers and our company. Um, some folks on here might go, mm, I think that means I could break a build. That sounds, that sounds pretty sweet. But really that word, I think, and the part of what we're talking about implies this like all or nothing, shift everything all of the way left security thinking. And for a lot of people, it's really overwhelming. 
Yeah. So I, I totally agree with you. Like when we talk to security people and specifically developers, um, when we talk about shift left, it, it really triggers that like everything over here, oh, hopefully that was left on your screen. Uh, um, and nothing else in the middle, nothing else in prod, nothing like it's all or nothing to your point. Um, but what, what do we think shift left is actually trying to help you do as an organization? I mean, I feel like it's a lot like DevOps, which is the world that I came from and what DevOps did for developers and operations and almost creating a new category of process titles, employment. And when we think about a continuous API and application security program, really the point is it's intended to give you increased observability increased accountability and more shared responsibility across your organization. And the benefits of which are really being able to ship features and value to your customers faster, but safer. So that's what we're talking about today. Yeah. Uh, all right, cool. I'd love to pick your favorite emoji in the chat and pick your favorite emoji, what shift left means to you while we go through this next yeah, see, that just one, one. That's kind yeah. of interesting. <laughs> surprise, one singular emoji. What does shift left mean to you? Hoping we get one puke emoji. Okay. Uh, so let's talk a little bit, set the stage here about uh, how AppSec testing happens today. Um, and then we're going to launch another poll and we're going to talk about what frustrates you most about AppSec. Ooh, look at all this. We got, uh, we got one frowny face, a rocket ship uh the party favor thing i don't know what the explosion is supposed to mean like boom it's great or boom it's not great <laughs> uh so i love that but here so we've kind of listed some of the things that are how appsec testing happens today and then some of the downfalls that come out of that right so testing happens infrequently and for a lot of organizations that kind of takes the form of like an annual pen test or monthly testing or maybe weekly testing. If you're getting really good left of boom, um, if you're getting really good at doing some of that stuff um, and then testing kind of openly happens in production uh, and that, and that results in stuff like long, you know, in our DAST world, long test times, uh, lengthy feedback loops. So you got to get stuff into production before you can tell developers about things they got to fix. Uh, tough to configure tooling and the separated roles between who's doing and finding and fixing. And oh, by the way, the bugs are in production. Maybe my least favorite thing about that. Joni, you want to hit a couple of these other ones? Yeah, absolutely. Um, as we all know, our testing resources are very limited. So if you're trying to scale your AppSec program, you know we commonly talk about a hundred developers per single security person who also has other things on their plate other than just AppSec. So it makes it that leads to you know infrequent testing, but we just don't have we cannot hire enough humans to do this job at the pace of software delivery, and then at the end of the day, nothing gets fixed. You have people who are testing in prod, you know, becoming glorified ticket shufflers, which there's nothing worse, throwing those things over the wall. And then as a product person, I'm like, wait, you're messing up my sprint. <laughs> like I have a bunch of commitments that I've made to the business and to the company. And my engineers haven't even seen this code in the last four months or weeks. And they're on to another project. So that's creating a ton of rework and then ultimately uh, just a lot of frustration because we aren't actually able to fix the vulnerabilities that we're finding on an appropriate cadence and a responsible cadence for our business. Yeah, and it just I think it just turns into like this, hey, we should fix this thing, why? Hey, we should fix this thing, why? Hey, we should fix this thing, why? And then my favorite topic in the whole world comes in. Well, we came up with these service level agreements, which means you have to fix things in a certain amount of time or do a risk acceptance uh, process. Turns out the risk acceptance process is not hard enough or the more favorable thing to do. Um, so we got some good good information coming in here on the poll. AppSec program frustrations, uh, scan times are too long, probably the, the least 
uh, picked one yet. I can't get buy-in from engineering. That's probably the highest one. I can see that. Uh, I can't test my APIs, obviously. Well, that seems like it's important. So yes, I get that. Uh, I can't test at the pace of software delivery. I think we were just talking about that exact point very specifically. And then the time to fix vulnerabilities is too long. And that was the last piece of what we were just talking about as well. So I think everyone's kind of in agreement on most of the stuff here. Uh, so Joni, pretty comfortable over here in my security role, uh, doing what I do today and it's frustrating and it doesn't work great, but why should I try to do, make a change in continuous, uh, security testing? Yeah. So coming up here, we're going to talk about why this is hard and it's hard because it's not just a tool you can buy and then it's magic. Right. So I'm not going to do the slides before we do the slides, but that's the point is it involves people <laughs> and that can be really challenging. So I've totally seen this movie before. It is exactly like <laughs> yeah, people. I know they're the worst. Um, I've in, in DevOps, we put the responsibility for on-call and uptime in the hands of software engineers at the last company I was at and traditional ops folks did not like or trust developers. So we're going to rewind, you know, 10 to, 10 to 12 years ago. It was a really new and novel thought that your security engineers would be responsible for uptime, getting paged in the middle of the night if you had downtime. Um, and what was happening is there was this very conflicting relationships between dev and ops people. The devs were shipping code on a Friday afternoon and then they were like, peace, I'm out. I'm going to go do stuff with my family and have a great weekend. And then the ops people were getting paged all weekend. They were having uptime challenges and it created a ton of conflict and there was a lot of mistrust. But those that figured out how to do it, to build uptime and observability into the software development process created a whole new category of employment, which you might recognize today as like SRE, so site reliability engineers. People who leaned into this were promoted for solving a company problem. Not meeting SLAs can be very costly. And a lot of ops teams realized like they were going to be the bottleneck and they had to use engineers because they were shipping code so fast. There's no way that that ops person would know how to fix those problems. And so what happened is the people who really leaned into the new process, who, who took on the challenge of doing this in their organization, they were sought after in the market because other companies wanted to make those same changes. Other companies wanted to attract that talent. And so those that leaned in, I'm sure you remember that at that time, um, really got lauded for the efforts for their organizations. And then eventually the whole industry just changed. So in application security also, I just think the train has totally left the station. Like we are shipping code several times a day. Are you playing music for me? No, that time? was my bad, no. <laughs> I was trying to make sure a spam call didn't blow up our webinar. And then I just started playing Foo Fighters. So uh, I like it. But anyway, so we're yeah, shipping code sorry. like several times a day. And it's completely intellectually dishonest to believe that the way we've been doing things in security is good enough for the pace at which we're shipping code. So it's also critical that we have to work closer with a team where there's traditionally been tension. But again, we've seen this and we've overcome it because we have to meet the needs of the moment and we have to use automation and developers to scale our security practices. So what you're saying is in the what's in it for me bucket, promotion, recognition, money, um, those kinds of things. And I, I think that's totally true. Like I've seen that in my security career where people who are kind of pushing the security team forward uh, and helping try to enable the business to meet their objective, to meet the business objectives are more, re more rewarded, more recognized, and then ultimately more listened to. And I think that's a really important point when you can help enable the business and you can get uh, show progress with the leadership team. They start listening to you, which is not a thing that a lot of security folks are very used to. Uh, they start listening to you on like ideas and how to make things uh, more effective and more efficient and help the business achieve goals because that's what everybody's here for uh, ultimately. And, and we've even seen that with some of, some of the StackHawk customers and in more than a few occasions, 
someone has taken on making this change and they were successful at it. And that made them valuable to their company, but it also made them valuable to other companies uh, as someone else who needed to drive that kind of change. So those organizations were looking for those kind of change agents to come in and help them make changes. Now, that's not great for us. We, we lost a Stackhawk champion at one company, uh, but they moved to another company and they often bring Stackhawk with them. That's great for us. But more importantly, it's so awesome to see somebody that um, we know that we're attached to um, move to another, another place and be successful doing that again and again and again. It's super awesome. Uh, let's see. We've got a comment here in the chat. Big fan of the embedded model. AppSec engineers should be embedded into product teams running a hub and spoke topology where we have SRE DevOps engineers and AppSec person into product software team, but they still report back to a hub team made of fellow security or DevOps SREs. That is a super great model. It is hard to scale that kind of a model. So good for you. Uh, it's hard to, it's hard to scale that kind of a model when you have 30 teams. That means you kind of need either you're spreading an AppSec person kind of thin across a bunch of teams or um, which is okay. It's just not terrible. It's better than none. Uh, or you're trying to hire like 30 different AppSec people and that's really, really tough. Um, but importantly, mm -hmm. Steven, my good friend, Steven in the chat here talked about he's uh, earlier, he said people. So let's talk about the things that we kind of need to improve to make sure that this continuous security testing can actually happen. And you may have heard of them. Uh, Joni, have you ever heard of the three-legged stool of org change? Mm, tell me more. Oh man, I'm pretty sure we went over this just yesterday, but okay. Um, Bruce Schneier made this famous, uh, but I also think he borrowed it. Borrowing is a really important thing that we need to do. Um, but it's really about effective ways you make change in an organization. And there's always three things you got to do to make successful change happen. You got to talk about those people. Uh oh, there we go. What's going on with my internet? You got to talk about the people. You got to address the processes. And then also you have to pick new technology that helps all of that work. Now, when people say people process technology, I think they say it in that order. And I think they do that on purpose. But let me ask you a question, Joni. Do you think you can do each of those things in a silo? No. <laughs> this cannot be a linear transition at all, all of these things have to be addressed at the same time. And I think a lot of folks that have tried to instrument change um, that maybe try to take the path of, I'm going to focus on the tool first. I'm going to buy this tool. I know it's going to be great. And oh, by the way, here, AppSec, or sorry, here, software engineers, here, VP of engineering, I just bought this. You have to do this. Right? That doesn't feel good. Like it doesn't feel good for you if somebody did that to you and impressed upon you. So getting that buy-in is so important. And even if it's just, hey, we're going to start taking this journey and I just want you to be aware. I'm not even going to ask you to do anything this year, maybe, but I want to start collaborating with you. That person's going to have so much more buy-in and be and collaborate with you on the process as you're buying tooling. So it cannot be linear. I, I know we, we've heard too many anecdotes about folks who have tried to do that and they're, they weren't able to achieve their goals. So uh, this is something you, as hard as it can be, you got to work on it all at the same time. Yeah. Got to talk to the people. It's always, it's always the bummer in the whole deal. Like you could do the technology and redesign the process. And if you don't include any of the people, go uh, try this experiment, go to the accounting team and go, Hey, you guys, we're going to get rid of Excel and then see how quick the pitchforks and torches show up outside of your office or maybe your zoom, whichever it won't go well. Um, all of this feels awesome so far, Joni, but I, I have a really, really important question and it kind of relates to the shift left thing uh, that we talked about earlier. Uh, do I have to go zero to hundred? Do I have to go all in? Do I have to go from what I'm doing today to perfection? Mm, wouldn't that be nice? Yeah. No, you don't have to go all in. So we are going to go over right now this maturity model about continuous application security. So 
let's start with the one, right? So someone who's a one, you know, I'm going to say something maybe rude, but it reminds me of like, I, I'm the neck beard rack and servers and there's no, like this cloud thing and, and, you know, deploying infrastructure as code is never going to happen. <laughs> it's, it's not a real thing, right? Resist change. And there are people in that category for whatever reasons, right? So when we look at the people process and technology pieces of that, it's, I want to run my scans in prod. I have no intention of shifting left. I don't trust my software engineers. AppSec is really just going to keep holding on to the way that we test and we're going to keep building tickets and we have no reason to change. It's good enough. Um, and depending on the needs of your company, right? Like if software is not the thing that your business makes money on, there's maybe five of you left in the world um, and you don't, you don't need to change. But if software is the thing that propels your business and if what the, 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 what your, the data that your software handles is important data, think about health data or um, financial data, all different kinds of high tar value target assets. We can't, we can't behave like that anymore, right? And then let's jump like all the way over to a four. Mm -hmm. This is like the panacea of secure by design. And what happens when we approach it this way, which typically companies, some, not all, can come to us and say, yeah, I'm, I'm here, I'm the head of AppSec, I'm here with my VP of engineering, here's what we're gonna do. I, I totally trust, we're just gonna pass this over to software engineers, we're gonna, we're ready to scale, here are our needs. That is not what everyone does, right? But they're on a journey to get there. And the value of when you get there is the breadth of coverage is amazing. Your find fix rate is awesome because your software engineers are fixing things before they're even deployed to production. You're able to scale your team because you're using, you have so many developers and they have tools for automation. So that's awesome. And then as a security team, your job is to trust and verify. It's to observe. It's to make sure that the standards that you've set for your program are being upheld. And if not, you know, sort of targeted action with other teams to make sure that, that they can help and are helping to uh, follow those processes. So that is like, you know, obviously ideal state, but let's jump back. So a lot of folks are in the two category. And what I call this is just this really pure desire to modernize. And you see this a lot more in the enterprise, right? So if I'm, if I'm a SMB to, you know, small mid-market company, you, you know, you generally know where all of your apps are. You have tighter relationships with the different folks who run run the programs. Their teams are smaller. It's easier to be a three or a four, let's be honest. But like, if you're a two, it's, I totally buy into this. Like intellectually, yes. Like I want to modernize. I want to automate my tests. I would love developers to take a first pass at remediation, but my organization, this is going to take time. And so at that point, it's, I need a partner to help me modernize. I, I just am not there yet. I haven't built that relationship yet um, with the development team. Maybe somebody there is like, I don't even really know what my team uses for CICD, but I can figure it out, right? So that is okay. And when you do, I'm gonna skip the bottom because it's a little stack hawk heavy. Like, we can share this with you guys later. Like there's totally ROI associated with our product, but that's not really the point. The point is that you can pick vendors to get started on this journey that can help you modernize. And then three, we have a lot of customers in two, which is like, okay, well, as an AppSec team, I do understand the technology that my team uses. Like I, I know what CICD tools they're using. I generally know how to automate these things. So I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and instrument automated testing. But I'm still going to field the results. I want to take the first pass at them as a security organization. I don't and sometimes this is like for a really pure reason, which is we really value our developers time and we want to make sure that we can validate these things before we're passing them over and interrupting them because you want to build the trust with that organization before you put a tool in and say, "Okay, now it's completely 
your job to do this, this foreign thing that you haven't done before, right? So that that is very common that on your path to a four, you get some automation going, but then the security team is still going to take the first pass at remediation or triage. Um, and we can talk, I think we have a poll coming yeah, up. Poll's, poll's going right now. So okay. AppSec Maturity Model poll is out there. Hopefully everyone has seen it. There's a lot of answers in there. So thank you. Uh, if, you're, if your machine is like my machine, Zoom is making it very freaking obvious that there's a poll and keeps popping it up over all the important stuff on my screen. Uh, but thank you for everyone for participating in the poll. We have really even distribution kind of in two, three, four. We've got one, one, and that's okay. Um, but eight twos, six threes, seven fours. And a few people who maybe feel like clicking a button here shortly and letting us know. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And it, <laughs> we, look, we love it if you participate in the poll. It really helps us kind of cater the content. Uh, we'd love to learn more about people who, uh, that are coming and sharing with us and, and participating. Um, now that Joni kind of went through all of that stuff, I would love to know where you guys think you want to be. Um, but I think we have some some anecdotes that we can share with you about companies that have, look, shameless self-promotion, companies that have come and bought Stackhawk and how they progressed in the journey uh, from a two to a four, a three to a, you know, hopefully not backwards. Um Joni, you want to start that off? Oh, my! I'm first. Look at this. We did practice yesterday, um, in case everyone's wondering. So the first one I want to talk about is a, uh, a company who went from a one to a three. Um, and this is a subsidiary of a Fortune 10 healthcare company with 3,500 employees. Uh, I had a brand new leader come in to the organization, brand new security leader. Uh, and they didn't really have a security testing application security program at all. So kind of a one-ish um, and, and they've done one and two before and they skipped right to three uh, and they skipped right to three because they didn't have a whole bunch of stuff to rework. They didn't have a whole bunch of kind of audits that they were meeting with their current tooling or process that was in place that was going to take a long time to unwind. And if you kind of have this greenfield opportunity, it's a lot easier to get into three uh, and like edge of three really quickly. Cause there's not a lot of things to unwind and there's not a lot of, I mean, maybe there's not even a lot of attitudes to, or, um, people that don't like each other because of what has happened before to kind of unwind and, and fix relationship wise. So that's, that's kind of one of our, a good example of one of our greenfield, um, customers that, kind of got to three, the edge of three really quickly, and they're quickly moving into four, which is super exciting. Okay, I got another one to three. I like okay. this one. It's a different one to three. Um, it's a Fortune 200 company in the end, energy industry. They have like 5,000 employees. And when they engage with us first, so something we do at Stockhawk is we say, you're going to have to bring software engineers to the POV. Um, I promise you it's for good reason. <laughs> our, our, our tool is very like configured as code. Um, but also it was really built to be automated and it was really built for, for engineers as the person who's touching it, you know, every day. So the security evaluator was totally disinterested in bringing devs, totally a what I, I don't, I don't trust them. I don't want to give them, um, they will never remediate issues. Uh, I, that's they will not... never have the ability to remediate issues yeah. or triage issues. That's right. And Works. But they still brought a dev. And when that happened, the developer development team loved the demo so much that they immediately automated tests. They jumped right to a three. And then engineering ended up actually procuring the product because they saw how it was going to make them so much more efficient and still meet their company goals. And so there's a lot of times from both the developer side that doesn't always understand the security discipline and tooling, but also from the security side that isn't as familiar with uh, engineering tooling that you might think you're a one, but if you bring in 
software engineers, you realize that they're actually really capable of doing a lot of these things. So don't let, I would say, don't let the not knowing about the tools that they're using in the processes kind of, um, you know, cloud the vision as to what's possible. Because the second they brought in that partner, they ended up so far on their journey of this automated testing. So um, I will stop preaching now and <laughs> go over to Scott to tell another story. <laughs> yeah, I think I, I really love that one that Joni was just talking about because I was pretty involved in that. Um, and And the thing that happened there that I thought was super awesome was, and Stephen um, made a comment here. He said, we started our modernized AppSec journey with Sneak, got embedded into pipelines, became aware of Stackhawk from uh, from Sneak. Sneak's a great partner. We love Sneak. Um, but yeah, I've actually run into more problem with getting cybersecurity on board. Mm. Uh, he's in DevOps. Um, and cybersecurity doesn't always want to be a partner. And that's totally a thing that happens a lot. And I think uh, for the security people, the security practitioners and leaders that are here, we have to embrace a little more accountability and observability in this to make it scale the right way. Like being able to go, what if someone makes the wrong decision on something is probably okay if they're documenting the wrong decision. Like you have the ability to go, Ooh, that's not right. We should go fix that. Because if you think about what's happening today out here in over here in one land, that's already happening. Like they're making those decisions today because they don't have the information and they don't have the ability to know and they're pushing stuff to production. I don't know how that's different than I can't fix this now. I've got to get this to prod, to prod. We'll come back to it in the next sprint. I would say that that second thing is even better or even like, hey, I, I think this is a false positive or we want to risk accept it and we document it. And then the security team has the ability to go, oh, uh, actually we want to fix that. We want to fix that now. The next best thing here is I know who made that decision. Now I can actually go talk to that person about that decision and the context of why it's important to go fix that. Uh, there's another comment in here. I tell people we need to be more like Voltron. We have all of our important pieces, but when we all come together, we create something epic. Joni, tell me who Voltron is. You are, I knew you were going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I have no excuse me. I have no idea. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Uh, Voltron, uh, <laughs> many, many, many robots, individuals, and then they make one giant robot. And that is a super powerful. Here we go. Uh, awesome. All right. I have another one. People, if you haven't seen, there's another poll up here. Where, where do you want to be on the maturity model here uh, in the next year? Lots of people said four. If you haven't answered that poll, please do. Um, I want to talk about a dating service company uh, that went from a two to a three. Uh, and they recently integrated uh, our tool into CICD with the AppSec team still managing results and triaging for developers. So that's okay as well. Uh, getting to the point where you're using automation, kicking it off at the same time, or even using CICD. Does everybody know that CICD can do cron jobs here? If you did not know CICD can do cron jobs, Steve and I, I hope you know. If you did not know that, put the uh, surprised face emoji in the chat. Um, but what they did was go, hey, instead of, instead of doing this weekly scan that we're kind of scheduling, they started automating with CICD how they're testing, when they're testing, and then they're taking that information and triaging it. And, and what they're trying to do is be sure that they're comfortable with the information that's coming out of that because they're planning developer training in next quarter, Q2 of 2024 to move from a three to four. So they get themselves familiar. And this is that part of that journey, right? This is the whole, I don't have to go zero to a hundred or in this case, one to four, all in one swoop. I can do little chunks of it and continue to move along. And so they're looking at that information. How does it work? Where does it break? for security teams, where does it break down so that they can get it in a solid spot so they can actually give it to developers and go, all right, we're partnering with you now. We want you to be able to consume this information uh, and then be able to go, 
yes, I can fix this or no, I shouldn't fix this. Or, Hey, I actually have a question security team. Can you help me about this? Which is such a great place to be. Mm -hmm. Okay. Last one, $5 billion health tech company. Um, I love this because it's an example of going from a three to a four. So started with automation, like we talked about the security team really wanted to build trust with the tool and, and capabilities, wanted to understand the kinds of vulnerabilities that were gonna be found, make sure there weren't false positives that were going to interrupt their development. Once they got there and felt baselined, they did a developer training with us, brought in a ton of devs and went from eight applications under test to 70 apps under test within a week of that training. So there's another bonus of involving more people, which is test coverage, right? When we can only see our app from prod, we tend to not actually test it very often because it takes forever and it doesn't test very deep. But when we test smaller bits of code and get more of our services under test, they're super fast. And then the devs can know before they deploy the production. And so, um, you know, Cheers for this company yeah. that did a killer job continuing to scale their test coverage and empowering their software engineers. So yeah. we've been looking at the slide for a very long time. We can. <laughs> hey, look, <laughs> we spent a lot of time making this slide. You're going to look at it for a little bit. Um, <laughs> real quick anecdote about that one. I think the really cool thing that happened in that one, it was kind of what we just talked about with our dating service company. This, this company was on the next version or next stage of that. And so what happened was that we, they brought their developers in to get trained on how to use the tooling. And they didn't go from eight to 70 because the security team set that all up. They went to eight to 70 because the development teams were like, oh, I can set this up. I actually want this to run on my, uh, on my applications and APIs that I'm developing. So that was the really, really cool part that even the security team there, I think was a little like, whoa, that went way better than I thought it was going to. Uh, okay. Next slide. So I've been, Joni, I've been out doing a lot of, um, people process technology in the last year. And every single time, if you've joined one of our webinars before, thank you. And also you've probably seen this slide before I've been asking everyone, what is the harder problem in application security finding or fixing? Uh, and every time a bunch of people answered it, uh, and we kind of got, you know, my, the, the punchline slide is this, like I always say, fixing, I think is the harder one because in my career, fixing has always been the, the harder piece, uh, of application security, right? There's lots of great tooling out there that can help you find problems. And I think getting people to fix it is the hard part, but every single time I'm out there asking this question, I get a half and half, I get a half and half answer. And so what it actually looks like when you're talking to security professionals is more like this. Um, people are finding, wait, people are thinking that finding and fixing are equally as hard. Wait, there's a question here. Are your customers mainly running DAST in the test environment or early in SDLC? Right now we're running sneak at the feature branch level because of the kind of tools they are, SCA and SAST. But for DAST, I feel like the best place for it be during development to test phase. I'm not 100% sure. This is a really great answer. Or a really great question. <laughs> I have a really great answer. Um, and you're going to hate it. It depends. It depends on how you develop software, what kind of software you're developing, where you're doing testing. Uh, the cool thing that we built into the StackArk platform is the ability to do that anywhere that you can. So we have some customers that are testing while developers are writing. We have some customers testing at the feature branch uh, PR. We have some customers that are testing at the, um, depending on how, again, depending on how you do stuff, you merge a feature branch into a develop, and then that deploys to a test or staging testing there. Uh, or testing um, just pre-production, also testing in production, like wherever it makes sense for you to test is where you should be able to test, just like your SCA and SAS. Um, and we always think test more frequently, more often, more, 
more and more and more and more so that you have more information. Uh, talking about finding and fixing, I, I get the sense, Joni, that people aren't saying, when I know about an asset, it's hard to find problems in security problems in that asset. Like maybe that's a little bit of it, but I, I think they're talking about something else. Um, have you have you been talking to anybody or know a little bit more about why this finding thing is popping up so often? Yes. Um, what I'm hearing, which I was going to say on the next slide. Oh, you mean this one? <laughs> When I'm talking to CISOs and other security leaders, so, you know, folks in their different positions obviously have different responsibilities. Um, wh when you're talking to a security leader, what I'm often hearing is they describe their needs around their AppSec program, and especially the larger the organization, this becomes very true, which is, I don't even know what APIs and apps I have. And so that is problem number one is identify my attack surface. And when we say that we're talking about APIs and applications. So that, so there are a little hierarchy of needs here. Once I've identified that, I can put a program in place and ensure that they are tested according to those, to the program, right? So is it, um, you know, certain kinds of applications need to be tested on the following cadence. That's that's the role of higher levels. Then the next thing is, well, now I need to, I want observability. Like, how is my program performing? Are people doing, are they following the rules that we put into place? It's a governance component, right? Are, is my program achieving the goals that we set out to achieve? And are people generally following? Now I, I know where my assets are. I know that they are under test. How is it performing? And once you have all of those pieces, I think that's what allows you to truly scale. So the scale is important here because we're actually being able to test all of our code, right? So that that is the problem that people are trying to tackle right now. I mean, Scott, what are you hearing? That's what I hear. No, you know, in security, um, asset discovery is probably the number one problem in security, even though there's lots of different problems, right? But the the thing that you hear all the time from CISOs and security professionals and, and people who are in the security business is you can't protect what you don't know about. And so there's tons of discovery tools out there that do, I'll find the things that you have in production and we'll categorize them and then and then we can go about testing them and then we can go about remediating. Um, but uh, that discovery piece is really, really important uh, so that you can do the other things, right? So that I can go, how am I testing? How often am I testing all of these assets? Uh, how is that program working? Do I need to make changes to policies or programs? Do I need to have conversations with other departments about why that policy or program is not working or how to make it better? Um, so I think that discovery piece is, is really important. And for all of the, uh, all the people that are out there, when we wrote this slide yesterday, uh, that top piece actually said promotion and raise, uh, but scale is probably more appropriate. Um, but just remember that's how you get to promotion range. So I, I want to talk about, uh, a thing that we're, we're launching. So Stackhawk is very, very much, uh, inside out kind of a security company really focused on developers, really focused on helping them achieve security and speed at the same time and attaching to how they build and write code. And that is a, uh, a really important facet of what we've got coming up next, which I'm excited about. Joni, what is oh, this? Oh, I get to do the announcement. Hawk, 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 what is, how Hawkeye. do we do? Hawkeye. Hawkeye. Oh, I see. Thank you to Aaron for the lovely name. Um, discovery and observability. So we are hijacking this webinar to tell you about an upcoming capability that <laughs> you can sign up for after this uh, for the private beta because we are super excited about it. And it it talks specifically, it's kind of it's kind of on either side of the scanning capability itself, right? Like we're super proud of what we built at Stackhawk, the ability to test APIs, 
uh, the breadth and depth of the solution, the ability to automate, like I could go on and on about features and like how they help people hit their goals or the challenges that they've had with more legacy DAST products. But what we're looking to do is solve the problems on either side of the fact that you have a kick-ass testing capability, right? So like thing one is where are all of the things that I need to get under test? And with the complexity of software development today, that is really hard for a security person to understand. That's okay, right? So we think of source code as your source of truth. And we've built some really cool capabilities that allow you to slurp in your repos. It's just going to be with GitHub first. We'll build others. Um, use AI to identify which have running applications and running APIs in them so that you can define your attack surface and see how, you, how far you are on the progress of getting all of that under test. And then on the next piece, observability is, now that I have it under test, how often is code being deployed to that asset? How often is it being tested? Does that match what we have set up as the rules on how often we want this to be tested? And if not, oh, look, this was the last person that committed code. I'm going to go talk to that team and make sure they get it under test, right? So what we really want to do is to support the security team in identifying what it is you need to get under test, but then making sure that your program is successful. So um, we are thrilled about this. It's coming soon. The private beta will be here soon. And we would love to show you. Um, and get your feedback on the capability. And even if you aren't using GitHub today, we would still love to show you and get your feedback on, you know, based on what your repository tool might be, how it, how is the experience? And is that a thing that's going to help you achieve your goals? So my infomercial yeah. is done. Yeah, yeah, it's a good infomercial. Uh, we're, like Joni said, we're super excited about this. The private beta is limited uh, space. So uh, one of the things that you're going to get after this webinar is the link to be able to sign up for the private beta. So if you are interested in seeing this and giving us feedback, that is the most important part, giving us the feedback, uh, please sign up. Uh, we'd love to have you. So we're almost out of time here. Look at this. We stretched it right into uh, eight minutes left. So we want to make sure we got time for questions. So if you have questions, queue them up in the Q&A. We'll try to hit them. Let's do a little recap of what we talked about today. So recap of uh, a couple of things. I'll start, uh, I wanna talk about Kaizen. If you know about Kaizen, it's a Japanese term that means continuous small improvements. Like continue making small improvements because when you do that, over time they make huge improvements. Don't try to do everything all at once. It will not work, period. Mm -hmm. Big bang, software deployments, big bang, Process change will not work. Make smaller improvements, smaller changes over time with smaller teams to which you will end up with uh, larger pieces. Joni? Uh, people process technology. We're, we can laugh every time we say it. It's hard. <laughs> uh, there is no magic and you have to work on all of them and you know, invest in the other humans in your organization because they will then support you in making the changes you need in both the process and in the technology. Yeah, benef benefits for the company. So all of the stuff that we're talking about here ultimately is help the company achieve its goals quickly. Uh, but remember, be selfish. Doing that is good for your career. <laughs> uh, then we spent time in the maturity model. So I think be reasonable you know, understand where you are and what the next step is for your organization and then pick the right vendors across the different capability that you need that you believe are going to help you get there. Uh, and then lastly, the developers and automation. Those developers and automation unlock application security scale, period. Like being able to automate with developers, have developers participate because they want to, because they do want to, it's crazy. Every single time they're like, I can do this. Sweet. I would love that. Um, as long as you're not piling on ticket after ticket, after ticket, after ticket, uh, small bits. Remember guys, they move quickly. They're, they're moving quickly to deliver value to their, to the business's customers. So you have to move quickly, uh, and that scale and automation, uh, and their, that team will help you be able to move with them.
All right, questions. There's one question in here already. Uh, I wanted to understand if automation can be done in front end and back end simultaneously. I'm not sure if this is a good question. There's no bad questions. Uh, that is exactly why we built our uh, platform the way that we did was so that you can do that. You can test front end and back end at the same time. Uh, and depending on what you mean by front end, uh, it could be front end API and microservice back end. You can test all of that independently and all of it together all at the same time if you want to. Again, it depends on what software you're building and where it makes a ton of sense to be able to test. Highly flexible in being able to do that. Great question. Um, Steven invited everyone down to his place in Fort Lauderdale for a happy hour uh, with Stack Hawk and Sneak. So if you're in Fort Lauderdale, come down and hang out with uh, Steven uh, and the Sneak team and the Stack Hawk team. Anybody else got any questions? I really, really appreciate all the conversation, the Q and A, people answering polls. It's been super awesome. Uh, if you have more questions, we've got a little bit more time. So drop a question in the Q and A. Happy to answer it. Uh, Alexa's back. She might have cookies for everybody. Cookies? Oh, no. Sadly. Oh, my God. All right, fine. There's a ton of Cheetos in the office, though. Oh. <laughs> like three flavors. Chili lime, flaming Hot, flaming Hot and Taki, maybe? I don't know. I'll oh. go look. <laughs> Come to Denver. <laughs> No more questions. Okay, everyone, no one else has any questions. If you have questions or you'd like to learn about how Stackhawk can help you move the maturity model in your organization, please come see us at stackhawk.com. Um, Alexa, I think we're sending out a link to the video, maybe the slides, maybe. I don't know, the, the maturity model is very proprietary, so I'm gonna have to get NDAs in place before we do that. Now that I think about it, we already showed it to everyone. So we could probably send that out as well. Um, also uh, the sign up landing page for the closed beta. Remember limited spots. If you really want to know, if you'd love to give us feedback, want to see what we're talking about, uh, please sign up for the closed beta. We'll get in touch with you. Uh, what else did I forget? You know, I think you covered it. I just wanted to say massive thanks to both you, Joni and Scott for this presentation the engagement um, via Zoom was on fire. So appreciate everyone joining in and being active and participating in this conversation. So we look forward to the next one and uh, expect to see a lot of information in, in your inboxes um, in the next day or so. Thank you all so much for taking the time. We super appreciate it. Thanks, Alexa. Thanks, Joni. Everyone have a great day. Uh, remember, East Coast has some storms today. <laughs> Some normal-ish uh, stormy weather on the West Coast. And in the middle here, in the middle, it's pretty nice. So if you're having a bad weather day, get yourself to the middle. Thanks, everyone, for uh, joining us today, talking about continuous security. We'll see you on the next webinar.